Hello. Welcome. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. So a couple of weeks ago, I got this book from the library. It is a book of Georgia O'Keeffe paintings. I have been having such a great time flipping through it every once in a while and studying some of her work. Today, I came into the studio with not the faintest idea of what to work on today. So I figured that it was prime time to do a Georgia O'Keeffe painting study. Doing painting studies has been something I've been wanting to incorporate more and more into my practice. There are so many benefits to it. The two that are top of mind for me are one, it forces you to spend a lot of time observing someone else's work. So you are more in tune to the brush strokes, the color choices, um, just the sheer amount of concentrated effort you're putting into looking at it is going to help influence you a lot and make you appreciate the piece a lot more. Number two is if you are painting something that you wouldn't normally, my assumption is that you will probably approach it in a slightly different way and end up using different techniques in order to achieve what someone else created and not what you would normally default to. So inevitably you will learn a lot of techniques through that process. So I desire to learn more techniques to then bring into my uh, paintings. So. We're gonna we're gonna do the study today. Well, I already I already did. I'm not actually just here to talk you through it. So hee <laughs> hee, didn't want to be deceptive there. Okay, so Georgia O'Keeffe is an American painter. She is known as the mother of American modernism. Which keep in mind, this is going to be a very simplified explanation. It is a movement typically characterized by abstraction with geometric shapes and bright colors. But winding back a bit, she was born in Wisconsin in 1887, where she spent a lot of her childhood painting flowers and fruits that she found in nature. Eventually, she went to Chicago to study at the Art Institute. There, she was taught the conventional painting techniques of European masters, which means that the focus was on reproducing the likeness of things in reality. I was not trained in this way. I would say I was barely trained to paint at all. In the few painting classes I took in college, the focus was to be very loose and experiment as much as possible. We were taught to focus on expression rather than precision, or maybe more accurately, we were taught to think instead of how to technically paint which is why I think sometimes I can get kind of impatient in this sketching phase. I don't often try to replicate things exactly as I see them because I think, what's the point? We have cameras. <laughs> this should be a whole nother realm of visual expression. But um, I think this was good for me, concentrating on proportions and lines here even though it's not the most natural exercise, it's still a really good one to keep those skills sharp. And I should probably do it more often. O'Keefe was really great at the precision of the work she was being taught to make, but she continued to seek out a different way of making art that she could feel more connected to. I once watched a video of her talking about her landscape paintings and I loved this particular quote. I thought someone could tell me how to paint landscapes, but I never found that person. I had to just settle down and try. I thought someone could tell me how, but I found nobody could. They could tell you how they painted their landscape, but they couldn't tell me how to paint mine. So she moved to New York where she learned under Arthur Wesley Dow, and he encouraged her to think about the abstraction of light, shape, and color. This was around the time she began to figure out a way of representing the worlds that she saw through emotive rhythms and shapes. Her early work consisted of abstract charcoal drawings, but eventually she moved into a vibrant world of color. When I look at them, I think she still kept the same clean lines though from her drawings to her paintings. A popular quote that I often see from her is, 
I found I could say things with color and shapes that I couldn't say any other way. I knew that I was using a totally different medium from her. This painting that I'm doing a study of is an oil painting while I am stubbornly using watercolors. These two mediums are, in my opinion, on totally opposite spectrums in terms of transparency and opaqueness. I probably should have chosen one of her watercolor pieces to work on, but struggling through this one forced me to figure out how to work darker and get more vibrancy out of my colors, which is something that I tend to not do so well. I just really enjoy light washes and mixing so many colors together that they begin to dull slightly. It was apparent that this wasn't going to be a great approach for this particular study. The paper would have gotten ruined if I kept slowly, slowly, slowly building these darker areas out. What I needed to do was lay down paint that was bolder and richer. O'Keefe would travel to different regions of the Americas to be alone and explore her creativity. She spends a lot of time focusing on details of shapes and colors as we keep repeating over and over and over again. Um, but she also experimented with perspective as a way of bringing attention to objects that get overlooked. And that brings us to her massive flower paintings, which she is most commonly associated with. Her flower paintings were popular during a time when there was a lot of fascination with Freudian psychology, but I suppose we haven't really gotten out of that era completely yet, huh? Anywho, because of this, many, including her husband, Alfred Stieglitz, were quick to link her flower paintings to female genitalia. She never personally confirmed the connection. It seems like for her, this was just a celebration of the shapes of the flower's form, a recognition and observation of the energy that they contain. It was more like an emotional evocation of the natural world, not necessarily a symbol. There seems to be quite a number of instances of misinterpretation of her work. For example, in a video I was watching of her once, she was talking about bones that she had taken from one of her trips. She was intrigued by animal bones and painting them, and people said that these paintings were associated with death because, you know, you'd often see these skulls being represented on top of vivid skies. But she said that these are just shapes that she enjoys, particularly against blue, and it never occurred to her that they had anything to do with death. She said, they were very lively. And in that sense, they seemed to have a way of outlasting the death that people kept saying they were symbolizing. I once read someone describing her work as, quote, a metamorphosis of natural subjects into abstract geometry. I love that. I think it encapsulates her body of work so well and what I hoped to find in doing this study. In the end, I think I got pretty close. Eventually. <laughs> My colors were definitely a tad warmer than hers. I think I saw some yellows in the painting and I probably went a little overboard with my placement of it. Some of my lines were not as precise because of bleeding paint from too much water and there were some places that didn't blend so well because I didn't manage the drying time properly. I really had to resist breaking out other mediums like oil pastels to achieve the depth of color that she had, but sticking with watercolors ultimately helped me learn so much more than, you know, trying to take other shortcuts because um, I, it got me to focus on how to maximize what they can really do. Yeah, so I'm glad I did this. With all that said, this painting study of Georgia O'Keeffe's Abstraction White Rose is complete. I hope you enjoyed this video. Hopefully I can keep it up and do more. 
Um, we'll probably keep going back to the public library as a reference, honestly, and to see what else is in there. I hope you're having a good day, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!